All right, we're in a series of messages from the Gospel of John. We're taking a chapter a Sunday. Some of these are big chapters, and sometimes we take a big portion of the chapter. Sometimes we'll take on the whole thing. Today, we're looking at John chapter 15. It's a big chapter. We're going to take on the first 17 verses of chapter 17. But first, I want to show you this picture. Okay, so this is the entrance to a hotel room in Israel. And so you see the number. And, but on the entrance, the door, the door facing there, you see the little diagonal box. Different color wood there. That's a mezuzah. And uh, if you're in a hotel in Israel, you're going to find one in every hotel room. Uh, a lot of people who participate in traditional rabbinic Judaism, they're going to have a mezuzah on their, on their doorframe of their home or their apartment. So when they go in and out, it's going to be there. Now, what that is, is a decorative wooden case, and it has different carvings on it. Sometimes they'll be stone. Most of the time, they're going to be wood. They're, they have carvings on them. They're uh, intended to be attractive but inside is a parchment. And the parchment, this special paper, has been prepared by a scribe who went to school and learned how, first trained in Jewish law, but then beyond that, they have been trained in how to trim the quill pen that they will use and uh, how to write the letters and how to produce this parchment, and they're going to grab things from Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 11, and they're going to write out verses from that portion of the law of Moses, put it on the parchment, fold it up, and it'll be placed inside the wooden case, and then attached to entrance to a home. Now, inside are the uh, words to the Shema. That's the focal point of what's uh, on the parchment in the mezuzah. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's a big uh, statement of Judaism. It's a, the reason they put it on on that spot in their home is because, again, of a command from Deuteronomy 6, 9, write the words of God on the gates and the doorposts of your house. So it's a literal, we're going to do exactly what they said. We're going to take God's word and we're going to place it in this strategic spot as we come into our home. It's going to be there uh, whenever we enter. Because the Bible also says you should, the Lord will be with you. He will guard your going out and your coming in. So they figured, well, a door post is a good spot to put the mezuzah. So a lot of people in, in Judaism and when, when I was going in and out, we were, had a group, pretty good group from our church, pretty good sized group from our church in Israel uh, last month or June. Now, uh, on every hotel, hotel room, you, you touch it as you go through. And so that's what the Jewish people do at their home or in any, any places where they find one. They'll touch it as they go in. And instead of saying the whole prayer, the whole Shema, it's just I'm acknowledging, hey, God, uh, keep an eye on me, going out, coming in. And... Uh, Basic tradition, basic daily life in Israel. Now, we live, you and I live in a culture that at our core tends to separate, and this is true of people who would say, I'm a, I'm a Christian, but it's true of a lot of world religions. They separate the spiritual from the secular. Like they compartmentalize. We're, I mean, you, you see this, right? Where they say, okay, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to do my spiritual stuff and then I'm going to go on with my life. That mon- Sunday is separated from Monday. That on Sunday, here's what life is like and I'm going to do this. And it's like touching the mezuzah. You say, just touching base, checking in, God. And now I'm going to go on about my business out there. Because, you know, it's a tough world out there. And to get, you know, get along, you go along. You, you play the game out there. And so there's a one, one thing that you do here. But out there, different story and uh, rules are different. But, but you do the touchstone, just touching uh, the God part 
on the Lord's Day. Now, we get some of that compartmentalization from the Greeks because the Greeks, they had these gods that they worshipped that they would never expect to have a personal relationship with a god or interact with them on a daily basis. Just, okay, I need something or I'm just afraid they're going to zap me because they're, they're so arbitrary in how they do things. So I need to offer up some kind of sacrifice to the Greek gods and maybe they'll do a favor for me. So it's a transactional relationship where, okay, I do something for them. They'll do something for me. And then we're all squared away and I go on about my business until the next time I need something. Two separate lives being lived. Two compartmentalized experiences. One, the spiritual. Touch base. And the other, oh, now I'm just living life. Well, the Greeks did it that way. And then the Romans, they adopted the same approach to their religion. And here's what happened. So Christianity develops in a Roman world. And it didn't take long for the Christians to, to just be captured by this thought process of you compartmentalize. As the Christians began to dig into big cities and their gatherings became larger, they start building buildings and, and it became a thing where... I'm going to be a Christian in this city, and on the Lord's Day, going to touch base. Then I can go on, do whatever I want to the rest of the week. I, I did my God thing, did my little, hey God, just checking in, let you know I'm still out there, take care of things for me if you would. And Monday, it's back on me again, and I can do it any way I want to, wherever I want to, living my own plan. None of that is what Jesus intended for his followers. Jesus never intended this compartmentalized life where here's the spiritual, here's the secular. Here's, here's the God part of me and here's the world part of me. But that it's Jesus all the time. It's every day, an ongoing relationship, not, not just when other people are watching or not just when I'm at the place of worship, but, but all the time, this kind of relationship. However, there aren't a whole lot of people living it that way, it appears, in, in the spiritual world of all religions and in all the different expressions of Christianity. And there are a lot of different expressions of Christianity today. So John 15, John 15 is in the middle of a four-chapter conversation. It's all happening. We, we get these chapters and verses, and they're helpful to find what you're looking for and all those things. But this conversation, it's an ongoing conversation through these chapters. Jesus is talking, the disciples are listening. They'll ask a question, Jesus will respond, but it's an ongoing conversation, same evening, same group of people, and all of it's gonna happen the same night Jesus is gonna be betrayed, and he's gonna be arrested, and he's gonna be tried, and the next day he's gonna be crucified. So everything that's happening here happens in the shadow of the cross. John chapter 15, starting in verse one. Seven times we know, seven big statements Jesus makes, the I am statements of the gospel of John. It's one of the ways he's organized this gospel. This is one of the big ones again. And I want, you, I want to remind you of this. When Jesus says, so many people will still tell you, Jesus never claimed to be God. Every time he said, I am, he claimed to be God. Because he used, when he said, I am, everyone in Judaism would have fallen back, horrified blasphemy because he just claimed to be God because he uses the covenant name for God the same one that God revealed to Moses from the burning bush I am Jesus claimed multiple times in multiple ways he is God and this is one of those big times he says I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser again the illustration we started with the children a moment ago Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. Already you're clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. Verse 7. 
If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. For this, by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Wow, how do you know if you're a disciple or not? Well, bear fruit. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus has teaching. Jesus has example in uh, verse 10. Verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends. For all that I have heard from the Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should abide. So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you. So that you will love one another. All right, keep your Bible open. We're going to refer back to these verses multiple times. Jesus has preached to the multitudes, but on this night, it's his closest followers. On this night, it's that inner circle of disciples uh, that he has spent so much time with. And so he's pouring himself into them now. He takes them to a private place for a private conversation. And so in John 13, John 14, John 15, John 16, here goes this conversation, extended conversation. All happens on the same night, talking to the same people. In John 17, we get the high priestly prayer of Jesus. And this is, in the model prayer, in the Sermon on the Mount, our Father who art in heaven, it's a model. of th- These are things that you ought to incorporate into your prayer life. These are important things to, to include in your praying. John 17 isn't a model of prayer. It's actually the, the largest recorded prayer of Jesus. This time, Jesus is talking to the Father And it is recorded in God's word. John 17 is really important. We learn about prayer. Now, we're going to be in John 17 two weeks. And here's what I want to tell you. Be here two weeks from now. You're really going to want to be a part of that worship hour. We we do a lot of teaching in church. And in church, you know, we say, you know, here's what God's word says. You ought to do that. Here are five ways to strengthen your relationship to Christ. Here are some key principles of, you know, take the model prayer and it breaks down. Here are things you ought to include in your prayer life. And now go, you ought to go do that. What we're going to do in two weeks is we're going to pray. How about that? We'll teach about prayer and then we're going to pray. And so they're going to, it's going to be a, a unique worship experience for us. Where we're going to get together and we're going to talk about what Jesus prayed about. And then we're going to say... And this is fun because you get to talk in church, move around in church. Uh, But we're going to break into groups. Hey, why don't you pair up with someone? Why don't you get in a group of four to six and maybe one of you, a couple of you pray out loud. But let's pray about the same thing Jesus asked us to pray about, modeled for us to pray about. And we're going to actually spend time in prayer on some really significant things and I think we're going to see God do some special things in that day. So don't, don't miss out on this. And trust me, you will survive this experience. It is going to be awesome. So that's uh, in a couple of weeks on John 17. Now, you look at Jesus here. Jesus, these are last words before they die. You want to listen to what Jesus is saying here. And he is summarizing his ministry. These are things, not a whole lot new. These are things he's already talked about in all kinds of different ways. Uh, principles, themes that we have seen before in Jesus' teaching. He is summarizing all of it in these four chapters. And Jesus is, remember, Jesus is taking them to this private room. They're going to celebrate the Passover. They're in that upper room. Well, the first thing Jesus does, he washes the disciples' feet. It freaks them out. They don't know what to do with this. He's the, he's the last person in that room that ought to be doing that, but he models for them. You ought to serve one another. He talks to them about loving one another. Last Sunday, we looked at John chapter 14, which is a, we we said last week is a verse of, uh, a chapter about the gifts that God gives us. And those gifts are generous and they are big gifts. Uh, We can also talk about it as promises that 
he uh, offers up to us. Because remember, there are two different times in John 14, we said, where Jesus says to his disciples, your hearts are troubled. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And he gave us some gifts so we wouldn't be troubled. We think about his promises too, where in, those, in chapter 14, Jesus is, is, is laying down some big, don't worry. Don't, you guys, don't worry. And here's why. Because I go to prepare a place for you. I'm leaving here, but I'm going there to prepare a place for you so you can be where I am because heaven is out there waiting for us. Here's a great promise. And then he says, you know, I know that may freak some of you out, some of you guys out, because I'm going to be away from you. But here's the great news. I'm always available in prayer. You can talk to me anytime. So don't worry. We can have an ongoing conversation. And we need to have an ongoing conversation. So keep praying. And he says, hey, you know, Jesus, Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, he's in, he's in a body on this earth. He's confined to a, to a place. He says, it's better for you, he says, that I go so the Holy Spirit can come. Because the Holy Spirit does not have those limitations, can be with you, each of you, everywhere, all the time. It's going to be awesome. So don't worry. You can still talk to me anytime. But here's the thing, the Holy Spirit's going to be right there with you. So don't worry. And then don't worry. All these things that seem so big and so overwhelming and so frightening. Here's a gift of peace that I give to you. Not the kind the world gives where as long as everything's peaceful, you're at peace. But the kind of peace that it overwhelms the hardest of circumstances. And so don't worry, because you're going to be okay. And here's how you're going to be okay. And then uh, that takes us into chapter 15. How we're going to be okay. How we're going to stay okay. Now at the end of, ver- of uh, chapter 14, see that last verse, verse 31? Jesus says, arise, let us go from here. So that's an important geographical note. They're leaving the upper room, and they're in Jerusalem, in the old city, we would say today, and they start traveling through the city. So it's a lot of narrow passageways, and it's ups and downs and backs and forth, and they're making their way toward uh, Kidron Valley. They're going to go down. The the old city's up. You kind of go down. There's a valley, and then the Mount of Olives is on the other side. Toward the bottom of the Mount of Olives, in the lower level, is the Garden of Gethsemane. So that's where they're headed. Because, you know, that's where Jesus is going to spend some time in prayer. Some lessons about prayer that he teaches the disciples uh, in the garden. And then he's going to be arrested in the garden of Gethsemane. So they're on that trek. But Jesus, every moment's a teachable moment when you're with Jesus. He doesn't waste anything. There's not a, okay, you know, now we're off duty. We can just walk. Jesus is always teaching. He's always speaking. He's always communicating truth. So on that journey from one side to the other, they're going to pass through the vineyards of Jerusalem. They're grapevines that would have, would have been there in, in that time for sure. And so they're passing through. And Jesus decides to make an object lesson of that. He sees the vineyards, sees the opportunity. And that's where chapter 15 kicks in. I am the vine, and the Father is the one who takes care of the vine. So we've got grapevines. You have the main vine growing up out of the ground, and there are branches coming off of it. And Jesus says, so think about this. So I'm the vine. You're the branches coming off of it that where the the grapes are going to grow. And my father, he's the the keeper of the vineyard. And he says to them, every branch that is connected to me is going to bear fruit. If it's not connected to me, it's not going to bear fruit. So... The message is, so stay connected to me because you want to be the productive, productive branch. Then at the end of the object lesson, he says this in verse 11. These things I've spoken to you. And so verse 11 is uh, a good transitional verse. These things I've spoken to you. Well, what has he spoken to them? You got to go back to where the conversation has begun and where it's going. Serve one another. Love one another. Uh, you, should, uh, you should be looking forward to heaven. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one's going to get to heaven except by me, Jesus says. Then just know you can pray anytime. The Holy Spirit is going to come, and it's going to be fantastic. The Holy Spirit to be with you, 
and you can have this enduring, persevering kind of peace. So it's all that he has taught them. He's taught them uh, after that about bearing fruit, all in the same conversation. And if you have all of that wrapped up, then that gets you to verse 11, that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. Because when you're living that life, that connected to Jesus, you can experience the benefits of it, the benefit, this overwhelming, overwhelming joy. Now, I am is a simple and profound statement in this passage. I am the true vine. My father is the gardener, first one. And I am is, there are different ways that we, we, in translation, it doesn't communicate as well in English as it does in the Greek language. And I don't do a whole lot of Greek language stuff for you. But here, it's a definitive article. It's not I am a true vine. I am the true vine. They're the only one. This is I'm, like in uh, John 14, 6. I'm the, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. There's not another way you're going to have your sin forgiven of relationship to God and go to heaven one day when you die. He's the only way. There is no other. Now, how is he the vine? Okay, again, Jesus laid all this down, and they're still walking through the city. They're going to pass by the temple complex on their way over there, and I think there's a pretty good chance they probably stop because there's something else in Jerusalem that is going to tie together this big sermon illustration that Jesus has given them. So they turned off the road, temple courts, and they come face to face with one of the most beautiful, powerful symbols in Jerusalem and in the temple. It's the vine of grapes. So there is this large vine, solid gold, of uh, looks like grapes, leaves, vines, and it wraps around the door of the temple. So we have an artist's conception of what it would have looked like. And they ha- got the little people there, the, my little happy angel people. To give you a size, a, a sense of the scope of this, of this temple door. And you see, going up the pillars around the top, these uh, clusters of grapes and vines. Josephus was a historian in the first century. He gives us a lot of snapshots into things the Bible tells us to give us more detail about it that historically. And he says, under the crown work, you know, under that uh, big top of those pillars, the work was spread out on a golden vine with its branches hanging down in form of a great height, the largeness and the workmanship of which were an astonishing sight for spectators. People were amazed to be to see this. this. This is a tourist attraction. People wanted to see this great vine. Now, the vine was Israel's image for itself. You know, in our country, we might say, uh, you know, the, the eagle is our a uh, symbol for our country or the bear in Russia. For Israel, it's the vine. And it shows up on their coins and it shows up in any number of ways to illustrate this is Israel. It shows up in the Old Testament multiple times. A symbol for the nation of Israel is the vine. However, the Old Testament tells us, makes clear, Israel's vine had deteriorated. That the vineyard had run wild. These are all biblical phrases about Israel as the vine, that the grapes were sour and bitter. The psalmist in Psalm 80 complained of the nation of Israel, your vine is cut down and burned with fire. God's judgment coming upon the nation of Israel, the vine. Jeremiah was quoting the word of the Lord in Jeremiah 2, and he says again to the nation, how did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine instead of a a cared for producing vine, just a corrupted wild vine. And then Jesus says, in contrast to all of that, Israel being the the unkept, corrupt vine, he says, I'm the true vine. I'm the vine you need to look to. Uh, for the for for Judaism, they had come to to see to see spiritual things as much like the Mazusa. Just touch base here and there when it was convenient for you. And then go on about your business. And Jesus says, that's not how this is designed to work. I am the true vine. The one and only vine. And you need to look 
to me for all things. And, and he shows what that looks like and how it should work in the verses wrapped around chapter 15. No other bind's going to do. We say we trust Jesus. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Lord. And sometimes using that language, it's not unbiblical language, but it does also communicate how we think about God. And it is, He is mine when I need Him. He's my possession. And I keep Him right over here in uh, my, my little scripture box. And when I need Him, I can go get Him. But the Bible really, when it talks about relationship to God, we are His. We belong to Him. We are connect, he's the main thing. We are connected to Him as branches. That, that's the picture of what a relationship to God looks like. Not, not uh, a religious touchstone here and there. Stopped off at the temple. Or for us, stopped off at the church. And now, I got that done, and I can go on about my business for the rest of the week. So, we're all attached to a vine. What kind of vine are you attached to? It's not enough to be in the vine, too. I have to get this in there. Not enough to be attached to the vine, but you're supposed to bear fruit. How much fruit? Whole lot of fruit. Much fruit. Abundant fruit. That's the kind of fruit, spirit fruit that will last. That means it's eternal. That there are things flowing out of our lives that are going to touch eternity. They're going to make a difference for all time. This is to my, this is verse 8, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So, that's important because if we're not bearing that eternal fruit, so this is how you know whether or not you belong to Him. And this is the evidence. It's not just what you say or, uh, well, you know, I, I touched the mezuzah here and there. But I'm bearing fruit. There's the eternal things flowing out of my life. And He said, this is how you know you belong to me. It, real disciples, this is what's going to happen. And if it's not happening, man, you need to really go back and look at that relationship uh, a whole lot closer. Now, the vines of Israel then and now grow in two types of branches. One bears fruit and the other does not. And so what happens is the keeper of the vineyard goes into where the vine is and, okay, well, here's a branch producing fruit, and here's one that doesn't. So, you cut off the one that doesn't because it's taking up nutrients and water and everything that you can get the one who's a producer, get a whole lot more value out of it if you get rid of the dead weight vines. And so the vine dresser goes in. Here's the other thing that happens. The, the branches that are producing fruit, the vine dresser will go in, and both of these things happen in the December, January, then and now. That's when this part of the process happens. They'll go in and they'll prune the good branch so that it can maximize, bear much fruit, be as productive as is possible. And how do we know which we are? Uh, here's the fruit that God Inspects. Now, there are a lot of things about fruit of the Spirit throughout Scripture, but there are, there are some core things in this particular passage that we're going to stick with John 15 today. There are a lot of other places we can talk about fruitfulness and what that looks like. But three things that he tells us in this chapter. The first comes out of verse 8. Our lives glorify God. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Jesus told us, let your light shine before men in such a way that may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. So here's one of the one of the ways that you see fruit in a life that says, yeah, I'm, I'm connected to the vine. And that is, shines glory. Shines on God's glory, not our glory. People don't say, wow, aren't you a wonderful person? They say, well, isn't your God a great God? So when was, think about this, when was the last time or ever that someone thought of you and it immediately caused them to thank God? You know, Paul talked about with the Philippians. He, he, he's talking about the church at Philippi, and he said, every time I think about you guys, I thank God. Automatically, it just springs straight to the Lord. Uh, are you living a life in such a way that not just, boy, that's really a nice guy, not a sweet lady, but are you living in such a way that when people see you, their minds automatically or quickly are going to turn toward eternal, turn toward the Lord? 
So first thing, our lives glorify God. Second thing, we have joy in Jesus. And the joy of Jesus. I have told you this, verse 11. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. When we are properly connected to the vine, as a branch off of the vine, that branch will produce fruit of the Spirit. The second one of those is joy. Now, Now think about this. How much, how's your joy rolling today? Is it easily taken away? Are you just kind of mad at the world most of the time? Uh, are you Fox News, CNN crazy about the world around you? Or do you, do you have a joy that overcomes circumstance? Are you tied to the ups and downs and you ride life like a roller coaster? Do you have a prevailing kind of joy? Because that's the fruit of a life that is connected to the Christ. Three, we reproduce spiritually, bearing fruit that will last. And so this is, this is the verse 16, eternal things. A tree reproduces by bearing fruit. So does a disciple in the Bible. Uh, a disciple is someone who makes disciples. You're not a disciple until you're reproducing, making more disciples. Research folks tell us 98% of people who say I'm a Christian have never made a disciple. A disciple. We talk about it, but we're not, we're not a disciple making people. We're not just about me. It's about turning that to make disciples of others. Spiritual fruit. Make disciples of all nations. Jesus told us in the Great Commission, Matthew 28. We're to tell what we know. Do you have a relationship with God that's important enough to you that you just can't help but tell somebody else about it? That... that your conversation naturally, the flow of your talk is always going to move toward the Savior, always going to move toward God's grace and God's glory. Is that just the flow of your life? So, what do we do to bear much fruit? How do we stay attached to the vine? We're living lives that bring glory to God, that bring joy, that bring others to Him. Well, before anything else can happen, here's the first thing that has to happen, according to John 15. We have to admit we need the vine. Jesus said in verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. And you know what? Most people are trying to do it apart from him. Trying to live life apart from him. Trying to serve apart from him. Because we're talented, gifted people. We can do so much. But Jesus doesn't say, apart from me, you can do some things. But he said, you can do nothing. There's nothing that's going to last, nothing that's going to happen that's eternal, unless you're intimately, closely, consistently, all the time connected to me. You're as dried up as that branch there. You you can't do this life and touch eternity in that way. (laughs) There's several several words that are so frightening in the Bible. One of them is going to occur in verse 6 and verse 7. If. If. And that... That says there's a degree of doubt this is going to happen. None of this is guaranteed. None of this is sewn up. None of this is squared away to say it is, this is the way things go. There's a big chance that all this goes bad. All this goes south on us. There are different words in the Greek language for if. This one declares this may or may not happen. There's some doubt taking place. It means we have a choice to make. Am, am I going to bear fruit? Am I going to live this life the way it's designed to be lived? Or am I going to choose to just free fly. Every Christian makes the choice every day and multiple times a day. I make this choice all the time, over and over again. And sometimes I make it really well, and sometimes I really don't do this very well. I get so busy just being me and doing my thing that I realize I haven't really spent a whole lot of time today making sure that in this choice, in this connection, I am, I am thoroughly all, uh, all Jesus all the time. Will I follow Christ today? Will He guide me? Will His teaching instruct me? And Jesus says to each of us as His disciples, you know, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And the question becomes, well, to what degree am I following? Because everybody's following you, just doing it well or you're doing it badly, Right? In the story of uh, Jesus, he is arrested. We're going to come up on this. He's arrested. And Peter, who said, oh, I'd never deny him. G- uh, Peter runs, runs for cover. And he's going to deny Jesus three times. 
But there's this telling verse that happens between the time Peter runs and Peter denies. And it's a little phrase that says, really the rest of the disciples, they just bailed. John stays pretty close, but it says, Peter followed at a distance. A lot of people follow Jesus at a distance. You know, safe enough to stay out of the blast zone when Jesus really wants a piece of you. Uh, when you follow at a distance, you're going to end up landing in the wrong place. If is a big frightening word. and It points to the ongoing responsibility we have as Christians that none of this works on autopilot. None of this happens. Our, our default mode is not follow well and stay connected and abide, remain in Christ. Our default mode is to sin. And we're going to have to choose and choose a lot when it comes to relationship to God, remaining in Christ. So by starting with this conditional if, Jesus communicates responsibility. And we're all going to say yes or we're going to say no throughout the course of a day to abide. So how do you do that? And uh, there are lots of, man, there are so many books being written about the Christian life. And a lot of them take the focus of here's the magic formula. It, this, is the, this is the magic pill. This is the, this is the wonder drug to make it all work out. And if you'll just do this, then suddenly you'll be super Christian overnight, and it's all just going to happen. Jesus tells us how to do this in chapter 15, and uh, it always comes down to the same key actions. The first one, admit you need to stay connected to the vine. We've talked about that, or you'll shrivel up and die. If you're not staying connected to Jesus every day, abiding in Him, choosing to stay connected to Christ, remaining in Him, verse 2, you're just doing Christianity without Christ. Most people are doing Christianity without Christ. I'm a Christian. I can just do it without Jesus. I think I can do it by my willpower, by my skill set. I can make this happen. And the Bible says that's just not so. Jesus said that is impossible. So here are the things to stay connected. First thing is pray continually. Verse 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. So, so think about prayer. Like, uh, how does, how's prayer working for your life? Most believers, they, they'll say, I wish I read the Bible more faithfully and I wish I prayed more faithfully. And uh, do you know how you get better at prayer? That's why we're going to do this in a couple of weeks. You pray. That's, I, I could... I'd never played tennis before, and I, took, I was going to be taking a class in college, Victoria College, when I started out in uh, junior college in Victoria, Harvard on the Guadalupe, we call it. And uh, so I thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read about how to, no, no YouTube videos then, so I got to read about how to play tennis. And I read everything I could find on how to play tennis, but you know, I didn't get, I was never very good at tennis until I actually got on a court and started knocking a ball around. That's when I learned how to do it. Same thing with prayer. It's going to work that way. But a lot of people who are believers say, oh yeah, I pray all the time. And one of the questions we might ask is, what are you praying? Most people, they say, pray all the time. Well, you know, I got, I'm praying, hey, that guy has a problem over there and that lady has, has this difficulty. And those are awesome prayers. Praying for praying people all around you. And God, get me out of this mess. And here's the disaster I'm facing right now. And you got to help me out. You gotta... So a, a lot of it is just sending up flare kind of prayer, prayer requests. Those are always going to be appropriate. But that's like prayer 101. That's, that's kindergarten prayer. The things I learned in kindergarten, I still do today. I'm great at standing in lines and that kind of stuff. I learned it in kindergarten, right? All those basic things you learn. Same thing with prayer. You don't ever stop doing those things, but you don't stop there with prayer. There are lots of things to build on. Think about it this way. In marriage, this is what happens in marriage, especially if you have kids living at home with you. Your conversation in the marriage becomes, okay, what time we need to pick the kids up? What time are we dropping off? Uh, did you pay the water bill? Uh, I need you to pick up the dry cleaning. And, and it's just taking care of day-to-day life at home. And that's communication in marriage. But if that's the only kind of communication you do in your marriage, and you're not really getting down to who you are and where you're struggling and what's going on in that relationship, relationship's not everything it ought to be. In fact, it's going to start breaking down. Well, prayer works the same way. Prayer is a relationship. It's a conversation with God. And take care of those crisis things and management things of life, but There's a lot of layers to prayer that go beyond that that we really need to lean into 
if we're going to experience everything God intends for us. So pray and pray continually. Then obey his word. Jesus, verse 10, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his word, in his love. So you're going to have to read his word and then you have to decide, I'm going to do what it says. So Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. He said that multiple times. If you love him, you'll keep my commands. I love Jesus. I don't want to do what he tells me to do. I don't want to live the life he's called me to live. Well, Jesus said, well, no, I don't think you really do love me. If you love me, you'll do the things I've asked you to do. So think about that. Sometimes just a confession that's needed. Is there an area of disobedience in your life or just an anger, a bitterness, uh, laziness, pride, lust? There are a lot of things. Are you, are you, your stewardship of life, you know, my time, my talent, my treasure we talk about. Uh, you're doing what God told you to do with that. Your spiritual gifts, are you serving, are you sharing, the, sharing your faith with other people? The things that he has entrusted to you, are you being a good steward of those things to carry those forward to his glory? So think about his word, what does he say to do, and what am I doing with that? And then love his people. Verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And this is, caring about other people is how you stay connected to Him, how you abide, how you remain, how you stay connected to the vine as a branch of that vine. Love His people. And how did He love us? He said, love as I've loved you. That's a pretty good qualifier. Unconditionally, absolutely, without hesitation. Here's the thing about loving one another. And we're talking about, in, I mean, Christians. I'm not even asking you right now to love, love the people outside the walls. I'm just asking you to love one another inside the walls. And here's, here's what we get in uh, the, uh, some big national surveys about church life. And again, this is Christians, all shapes, sizes, and flavors. This may not describe you. It may not describe our church all the way. But we get a, little, get a little of it in all of us from time to time. Here's what people say in national surveys. I love church. I don't have any problem with church. It's just the people that go there that rub me the wrong way. That's the part I don't like. Because you know what? People are messy. Sometimes they're dumb and they're jerks. And so I don't mind church at all. If I can just touch base, I just don't want to deal with any people while I'm there. No, that's not quite what, what God intended. God intended this to be a community of believers. And here's the thing. There are a lot of things about the Christian life you will never know unless you're with other people. Uh, how, how do I learn? How do I learn grace? By being with people that are hard to love. That's why God put me with you. That's why God put you with me. Yeah, so we learn grace. And you're never going to learn that in a, in a relationship unless you're with people. There's so many uh, Bible lessons that you're just never going to get better. You're never going to grow until you're with other people. And so he puts us together to learn those things. And... And as we love one another, uh, there's a whole lot of connectedness to God that is strengthened in us. This is my command, verse 17. Love one another. I, I read this, I'd heard this story once before. I didn't have it recorded. And then uh, Jim Dennison threw it out the other day. If you don't follow him, uh, his daily emails, they're really gold. And the Jim Dennison told this story about a retired Baptist missionary. And this is from pre uh, Vietnam War days. He's a missionary in Vietnam. And it was just a particularly hard season in ministry. People unresponsive. Difficulties within the churches that he was trying to, trying to work with, trying to form. And everything was frustrating every time he turned around. And it had just been a tough day. And his car wouldn't start. And it was oppressively hot. And so he's having to walk it in, see if he can find a broken down taxi to get him part of the ways way out, away from the house. His family was away, and so he's experienced just the loneliness of don't have my family close by. He got back to their missionary home to discover it had been stripped bare while he was gone. They had stolen ev everything in that house, except this one broken down couch that he said, you know, of all the things, take that. They left him that. Even thieves wouldn't take his couch. That kind of tells you where your couch is when thieves won't take it. They'll take everything else. He was so angry at God, angry about life. And he, This missionary, looking back years later, he's telling the story. He said, 
I just sat down on that couch, and uh, this is a quote from him. He said he just started praying in frustration. God, I can't do it any longer. I don't love these people. You have to get me out of here. He said, I do not love the Vietnamese anymore. He said he sat there for hours, praying, crying, angry, bitter. He said it was about 2 o'clock in the morning that he just heard a clear word from the Lord. And the Lord said, you're not here because you love the Vietnamese. You're here because I love the Vietnamese. You're not in the church because everybody's easy to love. And everybody, you're not here because... uh, You love everybody just great all the time. You're here because God loves us. God loves the people sitting next to you. God loves the people that live at your house. God loves people around you. And that's why we gather together for these times. That's why we do the love one another stuff. Our culture wants us to separate soul from body. Wants us to separate Sunday from Monday. And your Lord says, I want you to abide, remain, stay connected to me continually in my presence. Dependent on me in prayer, in obedience, loving one another. And we're making choices all the time. And I want to encourage you to choose well. Because the blessings that flow out of that kind of abiding, remaining, connected to the vine life. Overwhelm any of the difficulties you'll face trying to do it. Bye-bye.